crowd here tonight to support not only this great organization, but to also talk about a topic that is so important to the state. Um, and I know you've all got material that you picked up outside. I, Alabama is, is the nation's third poorest state. Nearly one in five of your neighbors and more than one in four children live below the poverty line. That should horrify every one of us, even if we disagree on the solution. You are that that's the situation. So following on the heels last night of the presidential debate, I felt it was important to state, guys, that this is not a debate. Right? Okay. This is a planned conversation that's not only between two of our finest leaders in the state, but also with you uh, at some point. This program tonight actually grew out of last year's program. Some of you are probably here when Wayne Flint, who was the speaker, talked about the unusual collection of people that were in the room at the time and how his views on the business community, because there were many of them here last year, had changed leading up to Amendment 1 because they supported that, which was not something that they'd always gotten credit for doing. I think you would agree with him, and I know all of us feel, that systemic change really only comes when you bring together a very broad coalition of people. And they're often the ones you need at the table who historically can be viewed as strange bedfellows in the social justice movement. So the idea was born that Wayne would have a conversation with someone from the business community, which would be for my forum tonight. So we have with us two men who uh, had very different paths in life that led them to be here with us tonight. Mike had a successful career in the business community as the CEO of Energy, mm -hmm. and has taken on a new role in the community, a very different role, at a medical not-for-profit small hospital as the CEO of Children's Hospital. <laughs> Wayne Flint is from academia, and he's a well-known scholar, author, teacher, and is known for his work on social justice in Alabama. And I'm not going to introduce them really much beyond that because you all know them, and so that would be, that would be redundant. Uh, I've worked with them, both of them, over the years in a, in a number of different contexts because they're involved in everything in the community. And while they are different, they have many similarities. Uh, there are probably no two people more respected in the community or in their, in their chosen profession. They are known for taking very principled, hard stands and being very vocal about it. So you've probably heard that. They have no problem saying things that make people very uncomfortable. Uh, they both have strong religious backgrounds, which I think gives them um, sort of a foundation on which to stand uh, when, when they think something is right. Mike Warren has probably has said many times to me, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, if you've ever been with him, is his father-in-law, who was a Methodist minister, always said, one should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and he has done that ever since. I mean, ever since he married Anne, I guess. Um, Wayne Flint has spent his career making the Southern Baptists and all the rest of us very uncomfortable also. They both have a lot of heart and a lot of compassion, and I will tell you that they are true originals. I think they broke the mold on both of them. There is no way to predict where this conversation is going to go tonight, which is exciting for you. Um, in fact, you don't really know what they're going to do tonight. So I'm going. They're creative. They are both have a keen intellect, and they're great conversationalists. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, your conversation about with them and how we educate and mobilize Alabamians in the effort to end systemic poverty. So, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your support of the Alabama Poverty Project. There are a lot of ways to do this, and in the perfect world that I envision, We'd be in the theater in the round, and you'd all be really close. And we could read your faces and your body language. So when you tell us we've done enough, uh, we shut up. Since that's not possible, we'll be here until around 12:30. <laughs> Actually, at some 
some point in time, which uh, I'm just going to predetermine, uh, we're going to enlarge this conversation to you. That is because we respect so much the quality of intellect and commitment and experience of people in this room so that we don't view ourselves as somehow different from all of you. And we would really like to have you participate in the conversation. So as we go through this, will you just make a mental note of questions you'd like to ask? And at some point, uh, we're going to invite you to participate in this conversation. Mike, I think to begin with, since uh, I know you well, and many know you well, but not everyone knows you well. And so I would like for you to just tell us who Mike Warren is. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you, Wayne. Um, before I do that, I would alert you to the fact that when Wayne asked me to do this, um, he's one of those few people that I can't say no to. So I'm here with only two, uh, two things that are likely to be helpful. At some point in time, he said I could either phone a friend <laughs> or ask the audience. So, so be alert to that. <laughs> Actually, Wayne and I both in different ways uh, have significant connections with Auburn. Alabama and Auburn University. Uh, when I was eight years old, my family moved from Texas to Auburn, where my dad, for 25 years, was the head of the Animal and Dairy Science Department. I'm the only one here, I'm sure, who was born with manure between his toes. <laughs> but ironically, uh, agriculture was never something that was important to me or any of my five younger brothers. But our parents thought education certainly was. And if there was a, a constant thread as we grew up, it was uh, education. And one of the delights, as it turns out, is the Auburn Public Schools uh, were uh, excellent in at least at that time, and one of the lessons learned early was uh, there are pockets of excellence in Alabama in uh, surprising ways uh, sometimes. Uh, lawyer by training, uh, escaped Auburn finally when Ann and I married, and we went to Durham, and I went to uh, law school at Duke, and Ann taught in what we came to know affectionately as hysterical, I mean, sorry, historical Hillsborough, North Carolina, <laughs> uh, where she was introduced to the junior Ku Klux Klan, uh, which we thought was limited to Alabama, but we learned that it had a further reach than we knew at the time. Uh, returned to Birmingham uh, and was for a dozen years at Bradley Aram and then for some 25 at Alabama Gas and Energy until five years ago when uh, I retired from Energy and then spent the last five years at Children's of Alabama uh, trying to learn all over again uh, what it was like to be a new person uh, in a field that you knew almost nothing about. A lot of lessons learned over that time, and I look forward to our discussion tonight. He's been a little bit understated. He said I was at Energy Corporation for a long time. He was CEO of Energy, which is one of the most important corporations in Alabama. My word, we're all, we're all at least two persons. Most of us are more that or five or six or seven. But all of us are at least public persons and private persons. And I'd like for you to talk with me about the integration of your private personhood, your father-in-law's mother's 
us understand the intersection of those two words. No, Wayne, I think uh, probably one of the most trite statements, but most true, is how you can be a Christian on Sunday morning and also be a Christian on Monday morning and the rest of the week. And at least, I'm not sure I'm really a Christian, I'm Methodist. I mean, <laughs> uh, but I think that's one of the guiding lights for me has been how do you remain true to not only your faith but the inner core uh, when, yes, when people are looking but also when no one is looking. And that, I think, is a, a, a key uh, to being more of the same person in private and in public. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And I want to follow up on that. Uh, religion is so often a force for divisiveness in a community. And when you get to doctrine, when you get to theology, even when you get to ethics in some ways, it separates communities. However, on the issue that's important to the Alabama Poverty Project, which is the issue of poverty, it is absolutely amazing how unifying this topic is to people of faith. In the case of, of Judaism, the ancient Hebrews, uh, as the number two topic of all the Jewish Bible, uh, idolatry being number one, care for the widows, children, the orphans, oppressed, Strangers in the land. That's number two. In the Koran, it runs straight through the Koran, the responsibility of alms to the poor. Certainly in the teachings of Jesus, it's central. So in religion, that normally separates us. When we come to the table to talk about poverty, this is an amazing unifying topic. And could, could you follow on the track of that argument? You know, I think you're right. And a cynical, perhaps cynical uh, response is I've often found it much easier for us as Christians to be focused on those over there. Let's take care of the poor, the oppressed over there, wherever over there is. Uh, but the poor that are right across the railroad tracks or just around the corner in that other neighborhood Somehow, that's a much more difficult thing. And frankly, one of the things that I'm currently pleased about Canterbury Methodist doing is trying to understand what that big and wealthy church can, and essentially white church, can do in the Avondale area of Birmingham, uh, a, an area that's black and white and much less wealthy. It's going to be a very interesting experiment, uh, and we'll see whether we can turn outward as a congregation, close and outward, not just far away and outward. I want to pursue that just a little bit more in terms of your corporate hat, as it were, within that. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Mike has spent much of his life as a corporate executive, what I would call uh, trying to reform and to uh, make more ethical the state. Uh, this was manifested in his support for 8 plus, the Education Reform Coalition. It was reflected in his chief lobbyist role uh, for uh, Amendment 1 under the Riley administration to- How'd uh, that turn out? <laughs> raise taxes, I'm sorry. I just, the words just poured out. A billion dollars in taxes at that. Uh, not many chief executives of a corporation in Alabama, a public corporation, would have taken on that role. And I'm going to use a term that is unique to my profession, but I want to apply, maybe I even create it for your profession too. There are academics who move outside their academic role at the university and become what are called public intellectuals. The idea being that you take your, your study off campus and out into society in order to educate the larger population. I'm going to coin a term here for you, which is public corporate executive. 
not public in the sense that you're doing all the stuff that everyone expects you to do, like the United Way and, and uh, head of a fundraising drive for Children's Hospital, but that you're trying to solve the systemic problems of injustice in society. That is a road less travel, as you well know. And as I think about uh, your life, I think about Bill Smith, I think about Herb Sklenar, I think about Bill Cadmus, I think about, you know, there are a lot of other people who follow this. Clearly, though, this is a road, if not altogether not travel, it's seldom travel. Help me understand how we create people in society like Bill Smith, you, Bill Cadmus, <coughs> Mr. Dobbs, I mean, just, there's so many people like that, but they represent such a small sliver of the work. Um, you gave me the advantage of giving me a hint you were going to ask some questions in this area, so I thought about it a little bit, Wayne, and a, a thought I would share with you is this, particularly in a public company, there is a great deal of pressure on next quarter or this year, uh, short-term uh, focus. And the truth is, a 10-year tenure as CEO of a public company is about twice as long as the average CEO in a public company. Uh, you may be surprised to know that only superintendents of urban school systems <laughs> seriously <laughs> last a shorter time than the CEO of a public company. Uh, and so your, your focus focus winds up being very short. Another thing about it, I, I think, I don't know that it's innate, but it certainly is a learned behavior, and that is you have relatively short-term objectives or goals, and you work like crazy and have your team work like crazy to reach them. And one of the frustrating things in the area of public policy is it takes so dead gum long to get anything done. I mean, ask Bill Smith how long A-plus has been at and about the business of trying to uh, fundamentally change uh, K-12 education in this state. Uh, for a public company CEO, that's that long tenure, long time, is, is debilitating and it makes you not want to undertake something that doesn't have that objective out there that you can reach, that, that you can get there, you can celebrate, and you can then go to the next thing. Uh, and I think that may be a, uh, that's an excuse perhaps, but I think that's something I would share. <clears throat> Which brings me to uh, a classic example of the bifurcation in the corporate community. That is, on one hand, you have classic paradigm of economic development in Alabama. And that classic paradigm was that after the Civil War, 46% of the state's population was African American. Uh, law could not be taught to read and write. Uh, freedmen they might be in terms of designation, but freedmen they definitely weren't otherwise. And so the state developed a sort of business mentality, a corporate plan for 150 years which consisted of low-skill, low-wage labor, primary manufacturing, using the state's financial resources, anti-union, uh, anti-regulation, um, sort of free enterprise capitalism. And the idea was that with all this poverty, this was a plan that would work. You, you may have to give them tax incentives to get them to come, but they'd come and they would build upon this low-wage, low-skill labor force. 150 years later, the historian were looking back over this paradigm, probably the historian would say, the state made a serious mistake, it didn't work. And yet, it seems to me in many ways, a very large part of the corporate community and political uh, establishment is still working from the same paradigm that has failed for 150 years. Help me out, help me understand why if you're if you're doing the same thing over and over again and you're failing, this is not stupid. Um, it is. <laughs> it is. 
He's known for candor. What do you do with that? I think, I really think, though, the, the hope for us as a state in the area of economic development is to seize on the examples of success that are contrary to that historic approach. And I mean, my goodness, 20 years ago, we bought Mercedes fair and square. Uh, I mean, literally, we, we bought that uh, company and brought it here. Uh, but from that uh, has, has come now uh, uh, four or five other uh, automobile assembly plants. Uh, if you've been through one of those plants, uh, an uneducated uh, workforce isn't there. Uh, I mean, the number of robots and computers, and it's a high-tech world in there. It's uh, assembly, not manufacturing, really. Uh, but building on those successes, I think, is the secret for us in the future. We, we can't get there. We cannot get there with uh, knitting plants. That's not where our future uh, is, and we need to understand that. And that means we need an educated workforce. Uh, and that's why the work of an A-plus is so important. Uh, that's why the work of every college in this, uh, in this state to remediate students that are coming as freshmen is such a, a pain, but such a reality. Uh, if we're going to make fundamental change, not only do we need to celebrate and emulate our successes, we need to understand the changes that must be made in the, in the product that we're sending to those plants. Because you were uh, head of the Business Council of Alabama and served in that very important role. Uh, some of you know this is perhaps the most important gathering of uh, CEOs uh, and big views. Big views. Uh, and, uh, what you just said is so transparently obvious that there must be a lot of people in the Business Council of Alabama who know what you so is the failure to influence the political system due to the fact that they just don't want to take the risk, that they don't know how to mobilize, that they don't believe what you just said? Uh, in short, if, if political leadership is an oxymoron in Alabama's history, is corporate leadership also an oxymoron, except for those of you who represent this very special enlightenment? You know, I don't think we can overestimate the importance of political leadership. Uh, I'm trying to remember a governor of this state that consistently measured up at the highest level. We've had a number of them that from time to time would provide the kind of leadership that would rally the business community around them. But I think what's it's not an oxymoron, but it's not likely to happen that the business community would come together and make the political leaders do something. The business community can come together and make the political leaders do nothing. We can enforce a negative, but to make a positive happen, I think, is not likely. What we need in the state is we need political leadership around which the business leaders will wrap. Uh, There's been a lot of focus, including my own, on the failure of leadership, political leadership in particular. But I must confess that in many ways, I've always wondered if the failure is not just political leadership, if it's political leadership responding to the failure of the populace. Uh, whether, whether that's due to fear of the future, lack of education, lack of job opportunities, the fact the state is so provincial, there are so few people from outside the state who live here. Uh, I guess a sociologist or an anthropologist could spend a year working with this thing. But uh, I'd like for you to, to share with us your view of the resistance that comes from the sort of populist forks of the creek, uh, resisting change, resisting any new ideas. 
I think one of the things, Wayne, that uh, frankly, having spent time recently in the, the bowels of the UAB Medical Center and uh, rubbing shoulders with uh, the, those that are engaged in uh, the, the academic medicine uh, side of things, I have a new appreciation for the people that come into this state. That probably is true in the communities of all of our academic institutions, but I think it's true in capital letters at UAB because of the medical center. And uh, there is a significant diversity of uh, people, race, religion, all sorts of ways there. But the tragedy to me is how removed they are uh, from uh, the day-to-day goings-on of Alabama. Uh, there is a great deal of strength there that goes untapped. Uh, if we could somehow harness that, uh, we could move, I think, Alabama years ahead in a very short period of time. Uh, it has not happened. I don't really know what it would take to happen, but the raw material is there. The raw material is there. I'm going to check my watch. Thank you. This, may, this may count a lot of my style points in the debate, but uh, I want to involve you in this conversation. And so I'm going to ask one last question. Mm -hmm. I think there are, there are two journeys one takes through life. Uh, there may be more, but there are at least two. One is the success journey. It's sort of the success paradigm. Uh, one is the legacy paradigm. Uh, the success paradigm is basically, bottom line, what's your profit margin? Uh, how many toys do you have at the end of life? Uh, how, how big is your 401k? Uh, how many offices have you held and how successfully have you offered yourself for re-election? But then the other uh, paradigm is the legacy paradigm, where basically what you want is somewhere out there in the future when historians write about you, they say, Mike Warren was a really good man. He really not only excelled at what he did at Intergen and Children's Hospital, but he was just a good, decent man trying to move his sexual justice. For some people, obviously, the profit margin is what drives their lives. Uh, whether you're elected governor or senator, drives your life. Whether you're re-elected, drives your life. And this leads to a lot of pandering. Uh, it leads to a, a fair amount of political dem demagoguery in the history of the state. On the other hand, there are people I call legacy people who are always concerned about what is my son going to think of me, what is my grandson going to think of me, what are, what are the historians going to think of me. And then there are people in the middle who follow the success paradigm right up until the time when uh, the socialites get a little long in the tooth or the CEO is, uh, oh well, his company has not done so well and he's eased out the door or the politician finally loses and goes up to uh, uh, the place where Alabama uh, politicians go to retire. And then uh, it's sort of like they mentally call me and say, hey, Wayne, you wrote this about me in your book. And that's so unfair, but I really wouldn't like that. And that becomes when you begin to manipulate the legacy paradigm, because you want to say, well, if you just understood what I had to go through, you wouldn't have written that about me. At which point I feel like I'm a Baptist minister again, being asked to do confession for them. And I try to explain, I'm a historian, not a priest at this point. I just say what you did. And you have to live with the legacy of what you did. And that legacy is the legacy you pass down to your children, your grandchildren, your friends, and the entire state of Alabama. So I'd like for you to sort of end on this note of how you have coped with, obviously, an expectation of success in a corporate role. And yet at the same time, you seem to have been unusually cognizant of the legacy that you were going to leave behind when you and I are both returned to the dust from which we came. Mm. It's good that you leave the easy question for last. <laughs> in asking the question 
is that people really do think about the legacy and that that's a driving force. And it may be for many, I don't think it is for all. Um, to me, I, mean, I would like my legacy to be my children and my grandchildren uh, are proud of the person I was, not what I did or what I might have done but who I was inside, and they knew me well enough that they could have confidence that what they saw was what really was there. Uh, and that's, that's the legacy that I would want, not, sorry, not in your recitation of the history of Alabama or anything else. It's uh, what, what my children, what my grandchildren think of Pop. Pretty well said. At this point, uh, I know that some of you are just running over with uh, opinions, insights, and questions.